Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael in this afternoon for Judy Simpson. One sure sign of spring is when the garden centers are crowded. It turns out you're not the only one looking for annual flowers, tomatoes, and other vegetables. The choices can be overwhelming and you're not sure about the quality, so we asked our garden expert to give us some tips on how to choose spring's best plants and flowers. I thought it would be useful to cover a few tips on how to choose among the thousands of vegetables and flowers you see at the many retail outlets everywhere in the springtime. What I found and find for most gardeners is how well the plants grow later in the season often comes from how well they're growing now in the springtime. One of the first things I like to do is buy from a local grower and there's several reasons for that. Uh, one, the grower uh, really knows about growing the plants. You can pretty well rest assured they've been treated really well. Um, you can find out good information from the grower, how to choose the plants, what goes well together. Um, and you're supporting a local business as well. And when I come into a local grower, one of the first things I do is look at the crop overall to see how uniform it is. That's a good sign that's been uh, grown really well. If the, some plants are tall, some plants are low, worse yet, some plants are missing out of the pots or cells, that's a sign there's some issues with the growing that you may be bringing home if you buy those plants. Then I start looking at the plants, speaking of issues, uh, to see if they have any disease on them. One of the main diseases to look for is what's called gray mold. Of course, this grower doesn't have any, they've done well. But it, what you look for is a gray fuzzy growth on old flowers or old leaves near the base of the pot. That's a sign the plants haven't been grown well. So avoid the plants with the botrytis, as it's called, or gray mold. Now looking at some specific plants, uh, beginning with a tomato, which is basically the most popular vegetable that most people plant, you want one, and this applies to a lot of these plants, uh, in good proportion to the pot. You don't want it too tall or too short. Now the tomato is an exception to most other things because you can get a taller plant that's a bit lanky and spindly, sign of too low light, and plant it lower and it'll root along the stem. So for instance, if I wanted, I could plant this plant right here, take off the lower leaves and plant it even up to here and it would root on along the bottom part. That doesn't apply to other plants, but it does a tomato. So this plant's a good height. Uh, it's even got some flowers on it, which means you're gonna get some fruit sooner on this. Um, and it's got good leaf color. You wanna look at the leaf coloration on whatever plants you're getting. You want a nice green color, if that's a color. If it's a red leaf, obviously you want a good red leaf. Um, but not, uh, tomato's a great one because if it's hungry at all, it's gonna be very light green. If it's too cold, it's gonna be purplish. You know, you get cold, you get purple, they do too. They don't take up that phosphorus. One of the real keys, and you can tell, you know, growers do this all the time, is check the roots. It's often as important, if not more so sometimes, to make sure it has good roots. So what I like to do is kind of loosen it up a little bit, just the pot, and then just gently uh, pull, uh, lift it out, or even put your hand over it and turn it sideways. Don't feel, uh, be afraid to do this and look for roots. You want nice white, uh, roots on here, that's a sign of good, good growth and not uh, discolored, that's a sign of root rot. Uh, to the bottom, not too overgrown, this is a perfect rooting uh, for this plant. So it's a, not only good shape, but, but good rooting. So that's a, that's a real good sign. So don't be afraid uh, to look at the roots on these plants. So that's tomato. Now another popular plant is zucchini squash, people plant. And from this grower um, uh, here at Adams Farm Market in Williston, um, we have uh, zucchini and again one of the first things you can do is look to see if roots are coming out the bottom they're not but you kind of gently uh, loosen it and look at those roots again very nice roots white uh, not too many uh, just the right amount good leaves on top good leaf coloration healthy plants compare that to a plant I bought at a chain store national chain store uh, this has really been stressed it's growing sideways these were under an awning it was growing out to the light it didn't have enough water, it was bone dry, it wasn't getting water. There weren't staff there to water it and it was under the awning so it wasn't getting rain. Um, it, it's got a lot of lower leaves dying. Those are what you look for for that gray mold. I was talking to get on the soil surface and this may has some leaf spots. It may even be a leaf disease uh, that you'd be bringing into the garden. So again, um, you're paying almost the same amount or pay just a little bit more and get plants you know are going to grow. These may never grow, they may never yield for you if you 
uh, don't spend enough. So spend a little more, you'll get more than enough zucchini from these six plants for a family of four. And finally, look at a geranium here. Again, from Adams Market here in Williston. Um, just a beautiful leaf coloration here. Good sign of good nutrition, they're not off color. And uh, leaves to the bottom of the pot. It's a good sign too that it's gotten enough light. A lot of times if it's too crowded, then all these lower leaves are off the bottom of the pot. And then again, let's uh, loosen it a little bit and gently uh, pull it out. And there you go. You see very nice rooting on that one, uh, right to the bottom and uh, around, but not too rooted. Now let's look at another one here. And this is from a chain store. You can see the difference. Actually, this was almost the same price as this one, if you can believe that. So, um, but again, the small leaves indicate it's, and it was bone dry again, too little water, maybe too pot bound. You see that stem is really woody. That's been in there too long. It's overgrown. Uh, it's got uh, uh, nutrition problems with the leaves. But let's loosen that. You really have to tug on it, which is a sign that that's probably pot bound. And we'll pull that out. And you see the roots aren't white. They're getting kind of brown. Uh, it was too dry. Then when I watered it, the fluctuation may, may lead to root rots on that. So that one never will grow well either. So um, don't waste your money on really poor plants. And uh, it's better to maybe uh, spend a little bit more, get a few, uh, you can get by with a lot fewer plants like this than you can with the small ones. So to summarize on buying plants and looking for plants in the spring, you want to look for plants in good proportion uh, to the pot, good shape and size with leaves to the bottom, good leaf coloration, uh, dark green, not signs of nutrient deficient or water problems, and freedom from any diseases. For UVM Extension, I'm Leonard Perry. And our next segment takes us to a laboratory at the University of Vermont. It's a lab that helps people and communities all across the state, but it's also helping people in California and to the Chesapeake Bay. Here's more from Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollin. University of Vermont researchers are taking to the skies. They're using new technology to tackle some age-old problems. So in the spatial analysis lab, we deal with anything that involves mapping the Earth's surface. Jarlith O'Neill Dunn is the director of the UVM Spatial Analysis Lab. The lab is located at UVM's George D. Aiken Center and is part of the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. The faculty and research professionals in the lab work with partners both within and outside of the university. We work with a broad array of stakeholders. They include people within the state government, such as the Vermont Agency of Transportation, who asks us to go out and collect drone imagery after a disaster, or the city of San Diego, who we're working with right now to assess their tree canopy to help them plan a greener future. The lab specializes in extracting and interpreting large data sets. In San Diego, the city already had aerial imagery and came to the spatial analysis lab to get additional information out of that existing data. In their case, they wanted to map the tree canopy of the city, which is one of the lab's specialties. Another project involves mapping land cover in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and Delaware River Basin. And by land cover, we mean not just the trees, but the buildings, the agricultural fields, the wetlands, all of those things. And these are areas which decision makers need to understand how much non-point source pollution. So all this thing that can run off our land that gets into our valuable waterways and pollutes them, they need to know that. While much of the work does take place in front of computers with information that was collected elsewhere, there is a specialized team from the lab that travels throughout Vermont with high-tech mapping drones. On any given day, that drone team might be helping the transportation agency collect images of hard-to-reach infrastructure or participating in emergency preparedness drills with various state agencies or even responding to actual emergencies. We really got into the sort of drone business, if you will, and not the business of making drones, but the business of flying drones after Tropical Storm Irene and seeing the damage it did to Vermont and our inability to get overhead imagery quickly to the people that needed to make those decisions. All these satellites are great, but it takes a little bit of time to tell them the aerial image. And we're also the cloudiest state in the Union, so when a satellite takes a picture, 
it's not always a picture of what we need. It can just be a picture of a bunch of white fluffy stuff. So with drones, we can get out there quickly, map the area, and pass that information on to decision makers. And that may be something like a train derailment in Northfield, where we get that imagery and pass it off to emergency operations. Or it could be something like the stream studies that we've done in Plainfield, Vermont, where we're helping them understand the dynamics within their streams so that the consulting engineers they've hired to redesign their bridge have the information they need. The high-resolution information the drone team collects provides the most accurate and detailed aerial imagery possible. Along with analyzing data and providing information for their partners, the drone team collects imagery for the lab itself and also works with students to gather information they might need. On this day, the team is at Shelburne Farms with UVM Natural Resources PhD student Lindsay Barbieri who's doing research on agricultural management and the environment. What's really exciting is the drones allow us to be really flexible in the timing so we can actually fly after um, big events like rain events or management events. So f on agricultural fields, um, those management events are like manure spreading or harvesting. Barbieri's research includes monitoring and comparing corn and hay fields. She's looking at different ways the fields can be managed and how those treatments affect crop yield, the environment, and the economic bottom line for farmers. Within these two fields, what we're measuring is water. Uh, so in terms of surface water runoff, so uh, for water quality indicators, we're looking at uh, the field runoff that comes off of these fields. We're looking at leaching, so water that leaches through um, the soil column. So we have um, lysimeters under the field that are collecting all of the water that's leaching through the fields. And then um, we're also monitoring greenhouse gas emissions. The extreme high resolution images and the layers of information they capture create a 3D model of the landscape that's accurate to a couple of centimeters. That allows Barbieri to do detailed models of water flow to help her understand what's happening on the field level. Barbieri monitors the greenhouse gas levels on the ground but the equipment to measure soil emissions is cumbersome and expensive, and the process can be very time consuming. A recent advance in drone technology has given Barbieri the opportunity to take some of those measurements in the air. One of the other things that we're exploring on this grant and one of the maybe even slightly more groundbreaking areas in terms of drone use is actually putting oh, yeah sensors on the drone itself. So now instead of just getting imagery, we can actually put on the drone like a sensor, for example, for carbon dioxide, which is one of the gases, one of the greenhouse gases that we monitor on the field. So we can put this carbon dioxide sensor on the drone. We have a very small, tiny, lightweight sensor that we can put on the drone and then have it monitoring the atmosphere. So as it's flying these fields, it can record the carbon dioxide levels at each point that it takes. So we have it set to every two seconds. So we get these um, carbon dioxide readings and then uh, that can help us um, even more directly pair down to the field level when we monitor our greenhouse gases on the field level. Barbieri's research is still in an exploratory phase as she gathers information and figures out what will be most useful. She's looking to find a way to link the atmospheric data from the drone with the readings from the sensor she has on the ground. For now, the ease of using drones opens up a whole new world for her research, and she hopes that accessibility will inspire others as well. They're becoming really ubiquitous on the market in terms of, of even just like small children have them, old, you know, grandfathers have them, uh, grandmothers, every, you know, my grandmother flew a drone recently. Um, so, so the more people can, can use them, and I guess the more people can use them easily, um, the more that really opens up a, a wide range of monitoring capabilities for um, earth sciences. taking to the sky to get answers on the ground. From agriculture and the environment to infrastructure and public safety, the Spatial Analysis Lab is mapping the Earth's surface and providing information 
that will help communities in Vermont and beyond. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollan with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for joining us. We know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit Across the Fence.